let us talk a little bit about the question of chuva. <clears throat> let me try to map this out as clearly as possible. <clears throat> this is literally life-saving stuff because this is your opportunity to go back in time and correct mistakes that you've made in the past, unwind sins, um, undo spiritual damage. Now, I know that for all of Rabbi Hill's students, this is a purely academic. Uh, none of you have any, ever done anything wrong. But of course, if you ever meet anyone who has, <clears throat> you'll be able to tell them you know how to correct it. So let us work our way through the subject of teshuva, which the non-Jewish world translates as repentance, although I'll try to show you it's much richer <clears throat> than simply repentance, has many more components to it. And I hope you'll find this useful and very practical. And I'll try to scratch beneath the surface <clears throat> and demonstrate some of the complexities and some of the spiritual thinking behind this mitzvah. Is that okay, everyone whom I can see? Is that good? Okay. So let me do it like this. The mitzvah of tshuva, the commandment, <clears throat> repentance and self-correction, I will break it into its parts. And as we go through the parts, I'll try to explain a little bit <clears throat> beneath the surface uh, what this means. <clears throat> the mitzvah of tshuva has three components, sometimes five, and two divisions. Let me map this out on the imaginary screen in front of you. Imagine we'll make an imaginary whiteboard or blackboard, and let me paint up on the board the components <clears throat> of this mitzvah. And then we'll work through that map, if you like, <clears throat> in order to understand it. So the three essential components are vidui, which is confession, regret, remorse, and shame for the past, and undertaking never to do that same spiritually negative action, let's call it a sin, in the future. Can't possibly forget this. It is past, present, and future. In fact, <clears throat> Maimonides the Rambam, <coughs> who's the classic locus <clears throat> for these laws, the Rambam has 10 very famous and very, very amazing chapters on uh, Chuva, in his section on Chuva. And in these 10 prokim, these 10 chapters, he works through the details of the mitzvah. And most of what I'll be saying is based on his, um, his map. So the uh, Rambam phrases this mitzvah in one amazing sentence. And I, I, I suggest you write this down, blaze it into your memory. You can write it up on your mirror in pink lipstick you know, so that every morning you see it and you remind yourself to do this. And here's what the Rambam says. One amazing brief sentence <clears throat> covers all the bases. You say, Ana Hashem, which means, please, God. This is addressing Hashem. Khatasi, Ovisi, Pashati, Lefanecha. I've sinned in front of you. And here you use three words which indicate different levels of intentionality. First of all, uh, careless sin. Worse than that, deliberate sin. I knew it was wrong, I did it anyway. <clears throat> and thirdly, I did it because it was wrong, right? The most childish and rebellious of all, that is the third element. And of course, every sin always has at least some of these components. And then you say lefanecha in front of you. <clears throat> not that you offended the social norms, you know. No, this is not uh, offending the culture or the norms of the age. You went against the divine command. That's very important to know, lefanecha. That's your preamble. And then you go through the three elements of the mitzvah. You say are, asisi, I did <coughs> ABC. <coughs> you fill in on the dotted line your own personal confession. That is your freestyle. You put in your own words and you speak out the details of what you did. Then you say, <coughs> I regret and I'm ashamed of what I did. That's your declaration about remorse for the past. It takes a little bit thinking. Why does the Rambam include two elements, both regret and shame? <clears throat> we'll try to talk about that as well. <clears throat> and then finally, you say, <clears throat> I'll never do this thing again. Unbelievable. One sentence, and you are pure as the driven snow. All the sins forgiven. Some sins that are more serious require also a living through Yom Kippur. And some sins that are even more serious require that plus a certain degree of suffering. But whatever the sins require for their being fixed, they always require a chuva as well so that you take the sufferings or the Yom Kippur experience as an atonement, and that will affect, <clears throat> affect the correction. So that is one sentence, very beautiful for those who'd like to look it up. It's in the very first paragraph of the very first chapter of the Rambam's Laws of Chiva, and that is a formula you can use. And like the master that he is, the Rambam includes every element in that very brief, in that very brief statement. Now, let us go through the three components. First of all, let me map out for you the three, and I said sometimes five. Let me make that clear. 
that the mitzvah of tshuva requires these three components, but that applies only to sins that are personal. Let me explain this. Personal sins means sins between you and God. You broke Shabbat, you ate unkosher food, things that involve your own body, <clears throat> your own mind, your own activities, <clears throat> where there's no human <clears throat> victim at all. However, when the sin is interpersonal, that category of Torah that we call Ben Adam Lachabere, interpersonal, interactional sins, when you've hurt someone, when there's been a victim of your sin, these three are utterly useless until you do two prior steps. And here's where things get difficult. Step number one, you have to undo the damage, pay for it, fix it. And number two, even more difficult sometimes, you have to undo the emotional pain. In other words, the animus, the personal hurt, the personal, emotional, psychological damage or baggage. And a moment's thought will show you this is where things get difficult. Dealing with God, easy. Dealing with your wife's mother, <clears throat> or, you know, whoever it may be, not so easy, right? Until further notice, confine your sins, I would suggest, to those between you and God, because he is easy to deal with. But when it comes to fixing problems with human beings, with their hurt feelings and their pettiness, and sometimes not petty, sometimes the enormous hurt that they're being exposed to in a, a relationship, that can be enormously difficult to fix. So I would say there's good news and bad news. The good news is it can be done. The bad news is it may be extremely difficult. So let's say that again. <clears throat> Three components, <clears throat> confession, regret, and undertaking for the future. But preceded, if there was a victim, by two other steps, making good the damage and uh, getting the person's forgiveness. And these can be, as I said, very difficult. What happens if the person is not alive anymore? What happens if they won't forgive you? What if you can't face them? You're too embarrassed. <clears throat> there are many, many problems here. And we'll try to reserve a little bit of time for discussing those as well. But in general, <clears throat> the messy sins <clears throat> are the ones that involve others. Let me digress for just a moment, if I may, to point out that male-female interpersonal intimacy sins are not considered interpersonal. Let me make this clear, and I say this for a very important reason. The Rambam, of course, is the source for this. <clears throat> when the Rambam wants to give a sin that he considers to be individual only between oneself and God, very interestingly, he chooses the example, he's talking from a man's perspective, of a man alone with a woman, <clears throat> where sin was done, an illicit relationship was engaged, and that the Rambam very clearly states to be a sin that is entirely individual, single, and personal. And of course, the obvious question is, what does that mean? Why would he do that? But a moment's thought, of course, will show you the logic of this, and then you'll see why I'm pointing this out. The logic is this. What we mean by an interpersonal sin is where there's a perpetrator and a victim. Okay, you hurt someone, you stole money from someone, you worked for a company, money, money found its way into your account in illicit fashion. These are all interpersonal where there's a harmed party. Two consenting adults, however, in an illicit, immoral relationship, in such a relationship, in such a relationship, in such a relation, you did not have a victim, you had an accomplice, right? Is that clear? Two people engaging in a relationship by consensual relationship there was a sin that took place, but that's not considered interpersonal. The fact that you needed an accomplice is not relevant. An interpersonal sin means that um, where there's an individual that you hurt. Now, of course, in a relationship, there may be all sorts of uh, uh, ancillary damage of, of, of misrepresentation and hurt feelings, but that's, those are peripheral issues. And therefore, I mention this because in the so-called Baal Tshuva world, right, Rabbi Hill and I, we work with people who are not necessarily raised in the religious world, people who come from secular backgrounds, and in that world, it's, of course, it's, many, it's very normal to engage in interpersonal relationships, intimate relationships, sometimes many, and many so-called Bale Chiva, when they become more religiously defined, sometimes feel they need to go back and open those old relationships to ask for forgiveness and make amends. That is generally a very bad idea, <clears throat> very bad idea. Unless you think it's essential, I'm pointing out very specifically and very carefully that the only type of thing that needs to be opened and revisited is where there was a perpetrator and a victim. And therefore, in these types of relationships where there wasn't necessarily a victim in the classic sense, the best advice there is not to, to reopen what may to prove to be wounds or relationships that can cause more harm than they, uh, than they solve. Now, Hill is asking me, why does Rambo would regret after stopping the sin and resolving? I think I need to think about that, Rabbi Hill. I think the point is that um, the Rambam begins with confession. That's what he begins with. So let, let, let's, let's talk about that. He says, first you confess, this is what I did. Then he says, you say, I'm ashamed, I'm regret and I'm ashamed of what I've done. 
And then he says, I'll never do this in the future. But that's in that's in chapter one, Robert. That's in chapter one, he says that in chapter two, when he defines to Shiva the chapter two, law two, he says very clearly, number one, first of all, to stop, as he was and then he says, be remove it from your mindset. Then he says, Kabbalah resolve not to do it in the future. And for me, quite strangely, he then says, Kharata, and after regret. And then at the end, he says, and then when you've done all that, now one needs to confess. That, that's his um, definition in law, which I've never understood by regret. Um, I think surely regret should be, you should feel regretful at the beginning. Well, no, I, I think I think that um, what comes first, of course, is a resolution, a realization that one did was wrong. That's not necessarily a deep, the deep work of regret, as I'll try to explain. So the first thing that happens is recognition of the sin and a decision to make a change. You can call that basic regret, but that's not what he means by regret. What he means by regret is the deep analysis of the personality of rooting out from the character. Right. And then, of course, again, first aid emergency, stop the sin. That's the first step. OK, let's get away from it. And then, of course, is the process of working through, again, before any consciousness and any personal deep work, is the movement away from the sin. Think about it the other way, Rabbi Hill. If you were undertaking regret first while still engaged in the sin, that would be totally insincere. And therefore, of course, step one is leave it, let, let's, let's drop the contaminating activity. And then we'll work through the emotional work that, I, I think that's, that's the basic order. So let us now, uh, let us now understand that Sin involves someone else, fix it, and undo the, uh, the, uh, the hurt and the resentment. Then go through the, the three steps. However, before I talk about that, let me point out to you that all that we've said so far is only section one of Chuba. And here's what the Raman does. In the first two or three chapters, he goes through all the laws of Chuba, and then he talks about free will and some of the mysterious aspects of free will. And in the seventh chapter, very interesting, he begins the same discussion again. If one has done something wrong, one needs to correct it. But if you look very carefully, you'll notice there are three extra words there. And the three extra words are just before dying. In other words, the Ramad is saying that there are two separate divisions of tumor. One is for all the things you've done wrong. That's one, that's one subject, one division. But there's another one. That's a global tumor that needs to be done just before dying. And of course, as the Mishnah says, well, how do you know when you're going to die? And the Mishnah answers, right, do it every day. In other words, there's a work on the character, a global type of regret or remorse, a global correction of personality. In a formal Torah terms, we'd put it like this. We'd say there is chiva for what you've done and a separate type of chiva for what you have become. Or in more, in more formal, formalized terms, chiva for actions and chiva for midas. Chiva for your actions, that's the first three chapters, and then chiva for midas, midot, aspects of character. That needs to be fixed as well. To make this dramatic, let me give you an extreme example, completely unrealistic, but dramatic in order just to show the point, make the point clear. Imagine someone who has never misbehaved at all, absolutely never, immaculate behavior, but this person has tremendous jealousy, but they never demonstrate it. This person flares with anger, unreasonably and at all times, but they maintain perfect control that no one ever knew. Inside them, they are hateful, they have low self-esteem, they have very problematic character but no one ever knows. This person has nothing to atone for in terms of action. They have never put a foot wrong, but when they die, they will live for an eternity with a very unpleasant character. They will be kept company, living the company of their own being as a very problematic personality. And therefore you can see readily from this example that there are two divisions of Chiva. Number one, fix what you did. By the way, there could be a person with genuine good character who's misbehaved, it happens. The person falls into temptation, they misbehave, but in essence, they're good. Or you could have a person who's of bad character, they've done lots of good things, right? There's a book about some unspeakably horrendous gangsters, right, or one particular uh, criminal. The book is called, But He Was Nice to His Mother. Okay, you know, he was nice to his mother. Yes, he used to kill people, but then he took his mother flowers, you know. So there's a discrepancy here and a mismatch between essence and between behavior. And the point that Ramam is making is you need two works of Chiva. Of course, you have to fix everything you did. But then there's another question. You also have to fix what it is that you've become. And I'll try to show that the work of Chiva, the regret that Rabbi Hill was, was mentioning and discussing, is really a deep delving into the character. It's not good enough only to fix behavior. We are looking to eradicate, and of course, this is the work of Rosh Hashanah, is to delve deeply 
into the primary or primordial motivation, then of course is the agenda. That's of course why I say this as an aside on Rosh Hashanah, we don't do vidui. We don't go through the confession. We don't worry about the details. Rosh Hashanah is not for that. Rosh Hashanah is simply descending into the essence of the character. And I'm here for the right reason. That's all Rosh Hashanah is. Hashem, I'm here for you. You king. That's all. We go back to the moment of birth conception. And that's all we talk about. But for the next eight days, as we work towards Yom Kippur, there we extend to the branches of the tree, not the root of the tree. And the branches, of course, are manifold and multiplex. And that is why Chiva is a working through all. But every time you work through a detail, the work is to descend to the core flaw in the character that led to that expression in detail. Otherwise, you haven't done the Chiva thoroughly. You've achieved self-control. Make no mistake. It's a great step. But unless you've eradicated the desire, you've not deeply changed. And I'll try to explain this as well. Now, in order to understand this more deeply, let's go through our map. Okay, you've written up on your screen in pink luminous lipstick, as I said, the three steps of Chiva. And um, these days, what do they use? Black, probably, with silver glitter. Anyway, I don't know. But the point is, you have done some, uh, <clears throat> some. Uh, you've, you've, you've bled this into your memory. Let's go through the components and try to understand them in detail. The first point is the vidu. That's the confession. The, um, of course, in the Christian world, confession is made to a human being. Christianity always tends to work through intermediaries. This is not the time to analyze that in depth. We are forbidden to do that. We always speak directly to the boss. Okay, we speak to God directly. In fact, no one else may hear your confession. If you are really ashamed, as the Shari Chiva says, you wouldn't walk around broadcasting what it is that you did wrong. And therefore, it's totally private and secret between you and God. I'm not talking about the confession we make on Yom Kippur. That, of course, is formulaic. It goes alphabetically, and you can scream that at the top of your voice. After all, we're all saying the same thing, and there's no shame in doing that communally. But when you get to the end of that list, and you add your own private stuff, then you sink into an undertone, and you say only your own private words that only Hashem can hear. You and Hashem only. So that is the notion of the vidui. Now, the first interesting question here is a question raised by Tzadok Cohen, one of the great Hasidic thinkers of the last <coughs> century, or a bit more than that. And he asks them a very interesting question. Can you do chiva without vidui? Can you do chiva without confession? And this is extremely relevant. You may be lying in a hospital with a tube in your throat, unable to speak, and very interested in doing chiva. Or a person maybe only moments before death, there's no time to speak, and they'd like to do chiva. These are very real life questions. And the question, of course, is can you do chiva without verbalizing what you did? And he answers, yes, indeed, and you don't need to be Jewish for that. Any human being using their free will, moving along a track to a bad destination, they wrench themselves off their track, clean up their act, redefine who they are, and behave correctly is totally valid as an act of tumor. However, it has two clear deficiencies. Deficiency number one, you did not fulfill the mitzvah. The Torah says, Visvadu, and you shall confess. In fact, the Rambam names his chapters on tumor. He calls it the mitzvah of confession. So the formal the formal mitzvah is, of course, the work of tshuva is in the heart, make no mistake. The essential change is change in the heart, absolutely. But the action, the carrier wave, if you like, the action that defines the mitzvah is the verbal confession. So somebody who's done tshuva and corrected themselves 100%, valid, no question, but they've not fulfilled the mitzvah. But more relevant to most of us, I think, is the second point. And that is that if you do tshuva without video, without confession, what happens is your, your train is moved onto a good track and you're heading towards a good destination. But my friends, the baggage still remains. When you look back over your shoulder at the train behind you, all the damage from the past is still, you're still accountable. You know, if you work for my company and for years, money finds its way into your account in illicit fashion. And then you realize this is not the way to be and you become my most loyal employee. You still owe me the debt. You still owe me the money, okay? I don't care how much you reform yourself, you still owe uh, the uh, money that was that was stolen and accrued. And therefore, if you behave badly and spiritual damage is done in the world, and then you do chiva, yes, you've redefined yourself and it's a totally vac valid act of chiva. You don't need to be Jewish for that. That's however, you still pay for the past. Now, chiva with vidui gives you the miraculous opportunity, an amazing miraculous opportunity beyond human understanding. And that is why the Talmud says that chiva was created before the world was created. It enables you to redefine yourself, move yourself onto a new track. And when you look over your shoulder, the baggage is gone. Or more accurately, it's no longer attached to your train. 
Let me try to explain this a bit more deeply. Tshuva does not undo the fact of the past. Let's be clear about that. If a person kills somebody else and then they do tshuva, the tshuva is valid. And the act of death together with the tshuva, their own death, of course, will expiate the sin. But the person doesn't come back to life. When Adam and Eve sinned and they brought death to the world, and as a result were exiled from the garden, they never got back into the garden. Okay, they never, they never expunged death from the world. So tshuva does not undo the fact of the past. What it does is redefine who you are, and you become a person who's no longer the person who did that sin. After all, tshuva redefines who you are. And the deepest definition of who you are is your desire. And therefore, if you, if you radically change your desire, I wish I'd never done that. Put me back in the same situation, you know, I say I wouldn't even want to do it again. You're no longer the person who perpetrated the sin, and therefore the sin damage remains in the world, but it's no longer attributed to you. There's a further step, which is where you do chiva from what's called chiva mi'ava, chiva from love. Not only do the sin disappear, but they redound to your credit. The debits become credit. Obviously, that will need an explanation, but that can be done very effectively, and that's an exhilarating thought. Now, now, I'm sure Rabbi Hill will allow me to make a Kabbalistic comment. I'm sure he will allow that for, for his black belt students. So let me give you what the Kabbalists say about what happens to the damage of sins in the past. You are welcome to ask questions, but not on this, I'm afraid, because even if you asked me, I couldn't explain it to you because this is deep in the Kabbalistic realm. However, it's a remarkable thought, and I'll tell you what is, what is written about this. The Talmud says the following thing. It says, if you'd like to look this up, it's in the tractate known as Shabbos, Shabbat. I think it's on page Peiches or Peites, 88, 89, one of those two pages. The Gemara there says that the verse in Isaiah, the first chapter in Isaiah, there's a verse which says, Im yu keshanim, If your sins are like scarlet thread, binu, they'll become white as snow. This verse we say, of course, on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. And that is a classic expression of the Mitzvah of Chiba. However, the Gemara raises an interesting textual question. The word for scarlet thread in Hebrew is shani. And here the prophet chooses to use a word shanim. Not quite the right word. It's a word that implies scarlet thread, but technically also means years. Years. And then the Gemara says like this. What the prophet means is, if you make your sins like these years of creation, kishanim halalu, like these years of ashturis ubois misheshes yimabreshes, that roll on from the six days of creation. Again, if you make your sins like these years of history, then you become white as snow. Well, the obvious question is, how do you make your sins like years? What is being said here? And here's where we need to be very cautious, but I'll say as, as, as clearly as I can, and again, no questions, please. Before you were born, your sins, in some sense, were inevitable. Before you were born, before you were created, your sins, in some sense, were inevitable. You know why? Because God foresaw them. Hashem saw that you were going to sin, and if he saw, he could not be wrong. This is the old, well-known problem of what we call Yedi and Bukhira, foreknowledge and free will. Before you were born, Hashem saw what would be, which means your sins in some sense were inevitable. Now the question becomes, why are you responsible if they had to be? The answer is because you did them. You put your name on them. You acquired them. You owned them. You enjoyed them. You wanted them. And therefore they're yours. Now what does Chiba entail? You repudiate them, reject them, disown them, no longer want them. You take your name off. And therefore, they become like the years of creation from the six days of creation. All of creation was foreseen. And your sins roll on, but they're no longer yours. All you can do to acquire a sin is to put your name on it. How do you put your name on it? You will it. You do it. You take responsibility. It becomes yours. Your responsibility and your punishment. But when you disown it, you detach your name from it, they roll on like years of creation that are no longer your problem. This is an astounding idea. Deep in the heart. Of the subject of poor knowledge and free will. Be that as it may, the important thing we need to know is that when you do chiva, you take your name off and the, thing, the sins are no longer yours. And therefore, that is what the vidui, the mitzvah of vidui achieves and enables you once you confess the sin with the regret and the shame, enables you to continue as a person who no longer responsible and therefore no longer needs to be punished for what you did. Let's take a moment to understand how do sins become credits? That's, that's remarkable. Not only disappear and dissolve, but they now become credits and redound to your, to your, in your favor. 
And the answer is this. I'll say the general answer and then try to illustrate it. The answer is that if you sin and then you use your sin to reconstruct and you become the kind of person who would no longer do what you did before, watch what's happened. You've used your fall as an element of your reconstruction. And of course, it redounds to your credit. You've only reached this level of righteousness because you fell. Without falling, you wouldn't have raised yourself to this level. You incorporate the... Um, you incorporate the sin, okay, into your reconstruction. Let me, since we're on a Zoom session and you can see me, let me give you a graphic illustration. Watch carefully, please. I'm going to make you a picture of this, and I hope this will be meaningful to you. Imagine a person moving along in life at a certain spiritual level, okay? This is a superior level. This person never sinned. Let's take the Rambam's example, a man alone with a woman. This person has never fallen into that sort of uh, temptation. But he enters temptation, he's alone with this woman, and he crashes sins, illicit relationship, and he falls. This person is now moving along in life at an inferior spiritual level, scarred and damaged by the sin. What happens later? He does tshuva. Watch what happens. You, you were at a certain level, you fell. Tshuva takes you back to where you were before, heals the rift. But what happens if you do tshuva mi'ava? Does not take you where you were before, it takes you higher than where you were before. And watch the mechanism. Please pay attention. I think you'll find this beautiful. Here's a person moving along at a superior spiritual level. But this person has a problem. They have a vulnerability. They don't know it, but they're vulnerable. Put them in temptation. They're going to crash. This is a person who has a hairline crack in his back axle. Right? He doesn't know it, but when it hits the curb, that axle is going to break. Here's a person with a vulnerability. Thinks he's a big deal spiritually. Doesn't realize that he has a weakness. Now he crashes. Now watch this. Sometime later, does Chuba. <clears throat> What's the Rambam's definition of Chuba Mi'ava? <clears throat> Says the Rambam, Chuba Mi'ava means... If you'd be back in the same situation, and it's very graphic, same woman, same place, same passion, same music wafting in on the breeze, you know, same, he's very graphic about it. Same youth, same physical uh, capacity. In other words, it's obviously impossible. But what he's constructing for you is a measure of tshuva. And this time, in that situation of passionate temptation, the person would not do the sin because of this self-correction. He's therefore better than he was before, no longer vulnerable. See the mechanism? So here the person's moving along, <clears throat> looking good, but with a problem. Crashes and then reconstructs and by definition reaches a place where he no longer has the vulnerability. Having fallen now becomes a moment that he relishes. He's now incorporated his crash into a process of reconstruction that he's eliminated the vulnerability. What an amazing life opportunity. That's the concept. You know, it's like sometimes I look at a person's x-ray and I say to them, you broke your leg 10 years ago. And the patient, the, the patient says, hey, doc, how do you know? Well, a doctor knows because a bone always breaks at its weakest point, but it never breaks there again. Because when a bone heals, it thickens around the fracture site, and that's one place it will never break again. And therefore, when this person has reconstructed, they've taken the sins of the past and used them by realizing deeply what an inadequate and insufficient level they were at and used that to reconstruct. Therefore, the person has become <clears throat> a person who has used their fall in order to reconstruct. Some of you may be thinking, this sounds like a good idea. Let's do a few crashes and falls and then we'll use them to reconstruct. Do not try that at home. Okay, do not try that at home. The Rambam writes clearly, if you do that, you invalidate the chiva. There are two exceptions to chiva. One is when you sin and you say, I'll do chiva later. Or when you sin and you say, Yom Kippur will fix it later. In such cases, the chiva does not work and Yom Kippur does not work. I'll take a moment just to tell you the Maral's explanation for that because it's exceptionally beautiful. Maral says, why does a person who sins intending to do tshuva later, why does tshuva not work for them? Listen to the Maharal's incredibly beautiful explanation. Maral says, when a person sins, rationalizing that they'll do tshuva later, what was the cause of the sin? The tshuva, right? They only allowed them to, themselves to do the sin because tshuva was, was in the offing that would correct them. Oh, you used chiva as a reason that you sin. Now you wanted to fix it. What a chutzpah. You shot yourself in the foot. In other words, I would never eat this cheeseburger. Absolutely not. But Yom Kippur's next week. Oh, I'll eat it. Yom Kippur will fix it. Oh, Yom Kippur was the reason you ate the cheeseburger. That was the reason. Now you wanted to fix it. You just perverted the fixing effect. Right? I think you can see the logic of this and very beautiful. Can yeah. you do to shiva for that thought, Rabbi Tax? <laughs> I hesitate to say yes, because who knows? We will take that in the wrong way. But the answer is yes. Everything can be fixed. Everything can be atoned for. 
but we don't set ourselves incredibly difficult agendas, Rabbi Hill, and therefore not recommended. Not recommended. The formal answer to your question, the limited formal answer is no, you've perverted the tumor and it doesn't work. But let me just like one aside, even where we have a deep tradition that tumor does not work, that even when God himself announces, I do not want, I do not want your tumor, like he said to Acher, all others can return, but not you. But this explains that was not a total exclusion. It was an immense test. Okay. The bottom line is no matter what you've done, you can correct it. But some acts are much more difficult than others. Okay. With that background explanation, let us give one more let's call it explanation, and then we'll go through some of the practicalities. Here's a question to answer. Tshuva is a verbalization of these elements of sin and intention. The question is, how on earth does that atone for a sin? You know, a sin has an effect in the world which can be enormous. In fact, Abdesla works through the consequences of a sin, and by the time you finish, you've damaged the whole world. There's the, there's the action, there's the thoughts of the sin and the fantasies and the pleasure, that's another sin. There's the time you wasted while you were sinning. That's another problem. The effect you had on other people, that's another problem. The fact that you got depressed after your sin, that's another problem. The fact that it got easier to do the sin again because you've done it once before is another problem. By the time you finish, you've done enormous damage in the world. And the damage ramifies and it rolls on and on and on. And what will happen to that damage? It will circle back and hurt you. It will circle back and hurt you. In Yiddish, this is called karma. Mm, yeah, that's the way it works right? What rolls around comes around because here's the mechanism. Watch carefully. You have a flaw in character that led to a sin. How big is the sin? Equal to the flaw in character. That's what caused it. Now, that sin in the world, how much damage does it do? The amount of damage that the sin causes because it's in proportion. How much pain does that cause when it rolls around and hurts you? Exactly the same amount of pain. Why? Because that's what you did. And why is that necessary? Because that's exactly the amount of pain that you need to experience to fix the flaw in character that led to the problem in the first place. Hashem built the world in a self-correcting mechanism. David, I'm not talking about a person who resists the temptation. I'm talking about a person who intends it and then does it. A person who has temptation and resists it gets reward for that action. I'm talking about somebody who thinks about sin and then does it. He's more accountable for the thoughts than the action says, Shara Chiva, because the thoughts soil a mind which is holier than a body. Therefore, the thoughts are more culpable. Now, here's the question. You've done all this enormous damage in the world. You get out of it by mumbling a few words. Hashem, this is what I did. I'm sorry, I won't do it again. Where's the measure for measure? Where's the spiritual balancing? Where's the measure for measure? How do you say a formula and escape all that enormous pain that you needed to feel? And the answer, watch carefully, is good news and bad news. The good news is it works. The bad news is you have to mean it. Deeply you have to mean it. You have to mean it so sincerely that you shift yourself through the distance that the pain would have shifted you. This is not a ritual, my friends. This is hard work. But let's say you're in this position and Hashem needs to shift you to the correct position. And for that, you need pain. You need enough pain. Shiva needs to shift you through the same distance. And if you do, you don't need the pain. Imagine a child has done something wrong. David, I see you understand and you agree. Yeah. Imagine a child has done something wrong and the mother's about to punish the child. I don't know what Jewish mothers use these days, probably electric cattle prods, or I, I'm sure it's brutal. Now, as the mother's about to administer this punishment, the child manages to convince his mother that he would never do it again, and he deeply understands what he's done wrong. Of course, you're not going to punish him. Punishment is corrective, not vindictive. God only punishes you because you need it. But if you don't need it anymore because you've made the change, you don't need the punishment. And therefore, Chiva escapes, you escape the consequences. But not because it's some ritual, but because you've done the work, and therefore you no longer need it. And this, of course, brings us to the final point, which is, Mother says to the child, I'm going out, don't touch the chocolate chip cookies. Mother goes out, kid eats all the chocolate chip cookies. Mother gets back and does something terribly brutal to the child, whatever it may be. Then she goes out again. Child doesn't eat the cookies. You know why? He's too afraid. Is he a better child? Well, he has self-control. Okay, that's a step. But he's not a genuinely different child. You know what the proof is? He'd eat them if he could. But if the child doesn't eat the cookies because he really understands his relationship with his mother and what it means to be reliable, etc., that child wouldn't eat the cookies even if he could. That's Shiva Miyava. In other words, Shiva Miyura gives you a self-control which is admirable, but doesn't make you a better person than you were before. Shiva Miyava means you no longer have the desire for the sin. You'd be eradicated from your personality, from your character. You wouldn't do it even if you could. You'd be disgusted by the thought of the sin. 
And that is why the Rambam puts two words in, I regret and I'm ashamed of what I did. Regret could be because you're afraid of punishment. I'm sorry I did it. But shame, that's a much higher level. Shame is always caused by incommensurate states. Think about it. If you can't succeed and you failed, you don't feel ashamed. You just feel like a failure. But if you could have succeeded and you should have and you let yourself down and you fell below your own standard, that's what caused shame. And therefore, shame means a genuine inner change. And that's why the Rambam includes both those words. Now, with that background, let's go through the, the, the aspects of the mitzvah. Vidu. Number one, must be spoken, not thought. Number two, a language you understand. That's very important. This is not a ritual. When you say the Shema, when you pray, when you do tshuva, you must mean, understand what you say. And therefore, any language is valid. Hebrew is better. That's true. Because Hebrew gets through certain gates in the spiritual world. But here it's much more important that the intention is understood and you, you, you mean what you say. As an aside, I'll point out to you that if you want the power of Hebrew and you don't speak Hebrew, you can use a very neat trick. And that is to speak together with a minion. When a minion of people, are, 10 people are praying together, you attach yourself to that minion. You can be a man or a woman, makes no difference. Once you join a minion, you are moving with a momentum. And we have a very deep tradition, again, based in Kabbalah, <clears throat> that when a minion prays together, any language is good. This is why we say Kaddish in Aramaic, okay, not in Hebrew. And we only say Kaddish in a minion. There are other reasons as well. But if you are davening together with a minion, a very good time to do it is at the end of the Amidah, when you switch into the singular, which for the first time is expressed in the singular. At the end of that, you say your name, right? Beautiful custom we have to say the verse in the Torah that corresponds to your name. I'm sure Rabbi Hill will explain to you how that works. You can look it up on page 924 of the Art Scroll Sidru. You'll find a list of first and last letters of Hebrew names. You say your name. That's your introduction of your own personal agenda. There you can pray for whatever you want. And that's a very good time to do chiva. And if you are speaking any language there, <clears throat> that is equally valid. Even if the minion's over, by the way, they've gone home for lunch and come back, you know, after supper. That doesn't matter. You keep going. Because once you begin with the momentum of a minion, you are getting through in the same way. And there is a very good way to do it. So number one, verbal. Number two, loud enough for you to hear, but no one else. Must be verbalized so that you can hear your own words, but no one else should hear it. Number three, a language that you understand. Number four, the more you say, the better. Says the Rambam, the more you say, the better. Normally in Jewish life, we try to say less. The, more, the fewer your words are, the more precious and the more meaningful. But here it's a mitzvah to speak at length. And there are many reasons for it. One reason is because the sin has many components. As I explained before, you need to walk through, work through the thoughts, the fantasies, the, um, the wasting time, and all of those things. As well, you need to delve into the depth of character that led to the problem. And that needs a lot of work. Let's say anger, for example. Very often, anger is driven by pride. Someone stood on my toes and I got angry. Me and my toes, you know. But if I'm no one, I have no ego. I wouldn't get angry because I didn't stand on anybody's toes. And therefore, the video is an attempt to get into the seventh chapter of Rambo, the second division, to analyze the flaw in character. This is a deep work of self-correction, not simply superficial. And therefore, the more you speak out, the better. Finally, there's one exception where you should not go into detail. Move rapidly on saying very little. When is that? Sitting there on Yom Kippur, you're doing tshuva, what else have you got to do? You might as well. So you mentioned some sin that you did during the year, and before you know it, you're back at the scene of the crime, enjoying the memory. Not good. In such circumstances, move rapidly on, leave the details to his imagination while you still feel some regret. That is a summary of the laws of the actual video itself. Secondly, I regret and I'm ashamed of what I did. Most of us can say that with great ease. Obviously, we're sitting in your kipper. We are anxious about what we've done wrong. The problem is the third component. I will never do this again. That's the problem. How can you say you won't do it again? Most of us have said that before. And we've done it again. You know, most of us, unfortunately, have weaknesses in our characters. And we faced with the same difficulties again and again. How often do you have to fail before you lose confidence in your own sincerity? This is a big problem, right? So let me give you a very uh, 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 a simple formula 
when you say you won't do it again, you know, it's like married couples, same argument, 35 years, the same. You think, darling, let's have a new fight tonight. You know, let's spice up this marriage. Let's find, no, it's the same argument. The same. She always wins. It's too terrible. You know, okay. Most of us are locked in battle with our lower selves in the same way. So here's the, here's the, here's the, here's the concept. When you say, oh, you won't do it again, you're not issuing a prophetic statement. Who knows what you'll do in the future? The Rambam is very clear what you mean. You say, Hashem, as I stand here now, if you put me back in the same, of course, it's forbidden to seek the same situation. But God, if you put me back in the same situation, this time I can confidently say I would not do it again. And you put your money where your mouth is. You don't go near that area. You put corrective uh, uh, mechanisms in place and preventive mechanisms so you won't do it again. That is what is required. Six months later, you feel low and you do it again. You do tshuva again. That does not invalidate the previous tshuva. What you may not do, however, is say you won't do it again when you're really planning the next time. That's a new sin. So I hope this is clear about what your intention is when you say that you regret it and you won't do it again. That is a summary of the three components of the mitzvah of tshuva. Let us turn briefly to the question of interpersonal sins where someone else was hurt. Before I do that, let me stop very briefly in case anyone has a question, something I've forgotten or didn't explain clearly. Um, if not, let me move on and briefly talk about the, um, the two uh, steps that need to be done. Uh, can we ask Hashem for help? Yes, indeed. Good question. Good question. Can you ask Hashem for help not to do it again? Indeed, that enters the zone that we call tefillah, not tshuva. Let's be clear about this. There are two aspects. One is the mitzvah of tshuva. We discussed that. Then there's a mitzvah of tefillah. In fact, some commentaries say that after you've done the tshuva, you should utter a tefillah for the tshuva to be accepted. But that's tefillah. If you look in the Amidah, by the way, you'll see when it comes to tshuva, we don't do tshuva formally. There's no confession, right? We are asking for our tshuva to be helped and to be accepted. Indeed, that is a very good Yes, you should ask Hashem to, to bring you to Tshuva and ask Hashem to accept your Tshuva indeed. It's not essential. It doesn't invalidate the Tshuva if you don't do that, but that's a very good, that's a very good thing to do. Quite, uh, uh, that's good. That's a good question. And in fact, that is mentioned as well. So, um, held accountable for our thoughts, Dalia. Well, let's answer that question. It's a good question as well. Let's be clear about this. You are only accountable for thoughts <clears throat> that, you're, that are your fault. Dalia, let's be clear about this. Let's say a person has thoughts of sin. Those are not bad. Thoughts of sin are always able to be applied in a positive fashion. For example, let's say, let's talk about a man. A man has a, a sensual thoughts about women. That's wonderful. That's the motivation to get married. Nothing wrong with that. Again, the essence of the thought, right, which wells up in a person's mind, appetites and lusts and passions, these are wonderful. These are motivations, okay, to be channeled in the correct direction. And therefore, those are not problematic. However, when a person stimulates illicit thoughts, dwells on them, or uses them to perpetrate acts that are negative in the world, that's when you become accountable. Okay. Secondly, if a person has a bad thought and then acts on the thought, then you're accountable for the thought because you used it to cause a sin. But if you have thoughts that you control, that's wonderful. Then you get reward for, the, for overcoming the temptation. So we're not talking about simple thoughts that there's another category as well. And that is when a person has done things that awaken such thoughts. You exposed yourself to materials or places or situations or media, let's say, that are stimulating areas of illicit interest. And then you waste time on the thoughts. And who knows, you may even act on them as well. You're guilty because you exposed yourself to a way, to things that you shouldn't have. You should have sought pure environments and pure experiences. And if you expose yourself to things that are tempting, then you're accountable, right? Because it's a consequence of what you did. These are the categories that we're talking about here. The question of thought control is a deep question for another time, but these are the guidelines. Let's talk about the two components of interpersonal sin before we close. The first is when a person has done something to someone else. Number one, you need to fix the problem. Sometimes it's easy. You work for a company. Money found its way into your account in illicit fashion. Pay it back. They don't necessarily have to need, need to know. Don't claim your next bonus. Make sure that the money gets back. That's easy. What if you can't find the person? What if you've been running a business? Okay. If you regret, not sure you will not be able to do it again, then you cannot say you won't do it again. You can't lie again. You can say, this is what I did. I'm ashamed of myself. 
Hashem, help me not do it again. But you can't do the full show of saying, I will not do it again when you're planning on doing it again. You can only say it when you've corrected. This is not a game. This is not a ritual or a game. You need to get to the point where you're not the same person anymore. There's hard work involved here. Okay, it needs to be a sincere correction. Now, the, um, the difficulty is if you need to pay back the damages and the person's not available, not to be found, not alive. One person told me he ran a dishonest business for many years. Now he wants to fix it. How are you going to find the people? How will you fix it? So in summary, I would say this. If the person's not alive, you owe their estate, their children. You owe whoever inherited their estate. That devolves like any, like any debt. <clears throat> if you cannot find the person, or there's no estate, or too many people, you should then make an accounting of how much money is involved, and over time, pay it back to a public or community cause. Okay? So you operate in a certain city, that's where your customers were. You do it, you pay back to a community cause, and that will divest yourself of the, of the ill-gotten gains, and it will it'll ripple back to the people that are involved. That is one method that you can use in those circumstances. So that is with regard to paying back the damage. Julie, we didn't talk about forgiveness yet. We're only talking about undoing the damage. So one step at a time. Now we come to the forgiveness. So here you need to ask the person to forgive you. And to usually the way to do that is an apology. It's a very interesting question whether you need to make the apology or simply do whatever is required to get them to forgive you. But they need to, I'm not talking about forgiving the financial damage or the, or the, the, um, the legal stuff or the money. I'm talking about the emotional baggage. That's what you need to, to get to a piece. The Rambam writes that if you need to forgive someone else and you don't, it's a cruelty, cruelty on your part. You should not be cruel. You should forgive. How do you bring yourself to forgive somebody who doesn't deserve it? They hurt you too badly. Years of dysfunctional relationship. They caused you all sorts of pain. How do you fix that? How do you? Three methods. Number one, man up, woman up. Raise yourself to the level where you forgive. If you can't do that, second method you can do. Remind yourself Remind yourself that this is bad for you. When you bear a grudge and a hurt against someone else, you're going to get an ulcer. Forgive them because it, never mind them. You, for, for, for your own benefit, forgive. If that doesn't work, there's a stronger medicine you can use. And if this doesn't work for you, there's no hope for you. What is that? Remind yourself that one day you'll be standing in judgment and you'll need to be forgiven when you don't deserve it. What will you do then? Try going to a court and saying, Your Honor, I'm guilty, but please forgive me. No, the judge will have you up for contempt of court. This is not social welfare. If you stand in front of God on the day of judgment and you say, Hashem, please forgive me, although I'm guilty. No, din is din. The law is the law. There's only one way you can get forgiven when you don't deserve it. If you once forgave someone who didn't deserve it, you'll be forgiven when you don't deserve it because you do, because you did. And what goes around comes around. And therefore, when you forgive someone who doesn't deserve it, you might be saving your life. Not the highest motivation, but it's kosher. So that is with regard to the forgiveness. And let me finish with this. What happens if you can't bear the thought of confessing to the person what you did? Or you think they won't forgive you? They'll bear a grudge against you. They'll punch you in the nose. They won't forgive you. What do you do? Here's a final thought. You can ask a person to forgive you without telling them what you did. There's a right way to do this and a wrong way. The wrong way is to walk up to the person and say, you don't know what I did to you, but could you forgive me? No. The right way is this. You say, hmm, you know, just before Rosh Hashanah? They say, yes. You say, you know, I heard this very interesting shira on Zoom in Rabbi Hill's forum some time ago. You know what I learned there? That just before Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, we all forgive each other for anything that happened. Isn't that interesting? I just came to tell you I forgive you for anything. And by the way, in case I ever did anything to you, I'm not saying I did, but who knows? Would you forgive me if they say yes? You got it. Now, of course, if they're mumbling a formula, it's irrelevant and useless. If it's a ritual, it's useless. They need to mean that they forgive you. The question is, is it likely to be meant? Yes, it is. Imagine a son comes to his father. Dad, don't ask me any questions. I've not been an ideal son this year. I've done stuff I shouldn't have. I need you to forgive me. What normal father wants his son to be punished on his account? Of course, he's going to say yes. Or in marriages, right? When each of a married couple forgive each other for what's happened. Of course, you want your spouse to be punished on your account. Not only that, you need her to forgive you. So you might as well forgive her. <clears throat> And therefore, <clears throat> that is a beautiful custom. <clears throat> as long as the intention is genuine, that is, um, that is valid. So what we have done in this brief session, we have covered the basis of tshuva. Three aspects to the mitzvah, two when someone else is involved. Underlying all of this 
a different dimension of tshuva, which is eradicating from the character. And that's the work of Elul preparing for Rosh Hashanah. The day of Rosh Hashanah is realigning one's agenda, really, before you even start doing the acts of the details of tshuva. Rosh Hashanah is Hashem, you the king, and I'm here. I work for you. This is the greatest company in the universe, and you need me. The company doesn't work. There's no king without a nation. Set the agenda. And then for the next 10 days, of course, you work on the details and trying to, um, and trying to, to get it right.